This is going to be a study on rightly dividing and the Holy Spirit. You hear a lot of talk about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And much of the lost world and even many Christians believe you can blaspheme the Holy Ghost and lose your chance to ever be saved. And they get this from Mark chapter 3 and verse 39. Go to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3 verse 28. It says, Verily I say unto you, All sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And if you never read your Bible and saw those two verses, you might come to the same conclusion as many others. But let's look at the context. If you go up to verse 22 in the same chapter, it says, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. And he called them unto him, and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, All sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewithsoever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And now look at verse 30. Because they said, He hath an unclean spirit. You have to read the verse after it. And so this situation was that the scribe said that Jesus Christ was casting out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Then verse 30 of Mark chapter 3 plainly explains how the men blasphemed the Holy Ghost. And this was by saying, He hath an unclean spirit. So these men claimed Jesus had an unclean spirit, and that was the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Jesus Christ was working by the power of the Holy Spirit, and they basically called the Holy Spirit an unclean spirit. And you can't commit this sin today because Jesus Christ isn't here casting out devils in the flesh. This is a completely different dispensation. Jesus Christ hadn't even died yet. The only sin that will send you to hell today is the sin of dying in rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe as long as there is breath in a man, then there is hope for him. You can't sin your way out of the day of grace. You can't reject Jesus so many times that he won't save you if you actually come to him realizing your guilt of sin and are willing to put your trust in the gospel to save you. He's not going to turn his back on you. So all these people that are telling you you can't get saved because you sin your way out of grace or you bless them the Holy Ghost, they're lying. You can be saved and you should be saved before it's too late. The unpardonable sin took place in the Old Testament. Mark is in the New Testament part of your Bible, but technically it isn't New Testament yet because Jesus Christ hadn't died yet. And proof of this is found in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 16 where it says, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. And until Jesus Christ dies, you're still under the Old Testament. And with that being said, let's look at the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. You see in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2 that the Holy Spirit took part in the creation. Just like God the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit has always been here. He's eternal. He was a part of men, men's lives in the Old Testament. Although he didn't work the same way as he does today. And all these people who are non-dispensationalists, most of them agree that the Holy Spirit wasn't working back then like he does today. Psalms 51 and verse 11 says, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not the Holy Spirit from me. And this is David speaking after David committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband Uriah killed in battle. He knew that it was possible to have the Holy Spirit taken away from him, although it wasn't because he had the sure mercies of David. And this is different from today. 
No matter what sin we commit, we can't have it taken away. The Holy Spirit departed from Saul in the Old Testament. If you look at 1 Samuel 18, 12, it says, And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. So the Lord departed from Saul. Once again, different from today. Today the Lord will never leave us and nothing can separate us from him. As Paul teaches in Romans eight thirty eight through 39 and other places. Uh, Samson also lost the Holy Spirit. If you look at Judges 16.20, it says, And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wished not that the Lord was departed from him. So Samson was different than Saul in that he got the spirit back before he died in the same chapter. But both Saul and Samson lost the Holy Spirit, and David knew he could lose it but didn't. The Spirit of the Lord strived with men in the Old Testament just like he does today, but there is a difference. In Genesis 6-3 it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. Today he always strives with man, and many well-meaning preachers will preach that a person can sin his way out of grace or reject the moving of the Holy Spirit so much to the point he can't be saved, and they'll use Genesis 6-3 and you can't use it. Jesus Christ said, I will draw all men. And Peter said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but as long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. As long as there is breath in your lungs, then there's hope. Don't die without believing on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. But now that we have seen the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, let's look at the Holy Spirit today. Many professing Christians will tell you that you don't get the Holy Spirit until you speak in an unknown tongue. And without getting into why we don't speak in tongues in this age, I'm just going to give clear verses showing when we get the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So when did, the, when did we get the Holy Spirit? After we believed. It's pretty simple stuff. A Pentecostal preacher preached during the funeral for one of my family members. And he talked about how this family member of mine got saved under his preaching. And they began to go out and do mighty works for God together. And he said that he believed that this relative of mine finally got the Holy Ghost. And so this preacher obviously didn't believe you get the Holy Ghost the moment you get saved. I didn't get a chance, but I wanted to show him this verse in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, which says, But ye are not on the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The verse plainly shows that a man doesn't even belong to God if he doesn't have the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, you become a son of God, and you are his. Therefore, Romans 8 9 proves you get the Holy Spirit the moment you believe. If you're a saint, then Jesus Christ is in you. Colossians 1 26 and 27 says, Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the Holy Spirit in this age seals the believer and will never leave the born-again believer. You can't lose your salvation. But now that we have seen the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and the Holy Spirit as we know Him today, let's look at the Holy Spirit in the time of Jacob's trouble. And this is where some of you may really disagree with me. Uh, a lot of great Bible teachers believe the Holy Spirit be will leave completely at the rapture. So therefore they teach the Holy Spirit isn't working on earth during the time of Jacob's trouble. And I have some verses that I believe proves this to be untrue. If you read Mark chapter 13, you will see that the context is dealing with the time of Jacob's trouble or what you know as the tribulation. It says in verse 11 of Mark chapter 13, but when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, 
but the Holy Ghost. So you see the Holy Ghost speaking during the time of Jacob's trouble in Mark thirteen eleven. And if you read that chapter, you can obviously see that the context is referring to the Great Tribulation. And you can see that the Holy Ghost is said to be at work during this future time. Speaking through men who are on the Lord's side. And many men today will take you to Second Thessalonians chapter 2 to show you that the Holy Spirit is taken out during the tribulation. And if you want to believe that, that's fine. I don't care. I have many friends who believe that. And I listen to all kinds of preachers that believe that. And that does not hurt my feelings or nothing. Let's look at that chapter and see if it is the Holy Spirit. If you go to Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and look at verse 7 and verse 8, it says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. People debate back and forth about who the he is in verse 7. And if you read the verses before verse 7, then it gives us the context and shows us who the he is. Now let's go up to verse 3. It says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So in verse 3 it is talking about the man of sin being revealed the son of perdition, and these are titles for the Antichrist. And verse 4 says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay, so who is the he in verse 4? The son of perdition, the Antichrist. He is the he in verse 4. And now look at verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Who is the he to be revealed? It is the Antichrist. And now let's look at verse 7 and 8 again. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Okay, now who is the he in verse 7, if the entire chapter was referring to a man, the Antichrist, the he is the he from all the preceding verses, it is the Antichrist. What this is talking about is in the middle of the tribulation, the man of sin, the Antichrist, gets a deadly wound. He dies, resurrects, and then Satan enters into him, and then he becomes the son of perdition. The man of sin is withholding the devil from having complete control. Compare this to Judas Iscariot, who was a devil before the devil even entered into him. And when the devil entered in, Satan had complete control. And now whether you believe that he in Second Thessalonians 2, 7-8 is referring to the Holy Spirit or the body of Christ or Michael the Archangel or the man of sin, it really makes no difference to me. You're at liberty to believe what you choose. I respect your opinion, just like I hope you respect mine. I believe that he is the Antichrist. It's referring to when the man of sin gets a deadly wound, dies, resurrects, Satan enters into, into him and becomes the son of perdition. And there are those who teach it as the Holy Spirit, who also still believe the Holy Spirit is here during the tribulation and just working like he did in the Old Testament, which is fine. But for me personally, I believe that he is the Antichrist. I also believe the Holy Spirit will be here working and active during the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, he won't seal believers until the day of redemption like he does now. Today when you get saved, you are sealed into the day of redemption. The day of redemption is referring to when you get a new body at the rapture. Romans 8.23 says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. If you go into the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation, the day is past. 
the day of redemption's past, and you're going into a time when the Holy Spirit can leave a person like he did in the Old Testament. And let's look at Hebrews chapter 6. And if you rightly divide this book, you don't ever have to change your word, subtract a word, add a word, or make it say something that it doesn't say. And I'm going to take you to Hebrews 6 and look at those verses without having to change a word in the verse. Now, if you are like me, then you believe in eternal security. I believe once saved, always saved. All the Baptist brothers and sisters you know and love, they also believe in eternal security. And they got that thing right about once saved, always saved. And now they want the whole Bible to teach eternal security. They want the whole Bible to apply to themselves in a doctrinal sense, even though we no longer sacrifice animals, even though we no longer keep the Sabbath. We don't stone people for committing adultery. And the list goes on. Yet if you say all the Bible isn't for me doctrinally, they will pitch a fit and call you a heretic. But the same way you can't apply every verse in the Old Testament for yourself in a doctrinal sense, you can't apply every verse in Hebrews in a doctrinal sense. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 is dealing with righteousness in the tribulation. Hebrews 6, 4 says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. So you see that it's impossible. Remember that impossible. Okay, now we have read verse 4. The person it is referring to has been enlightened. They have tasted of the heavenly gift. They have been made partakers of the Holy Ghost. No doubt it is a saved person. How can you be made a partaker of the Holy Ghost if you're not saved? And the Baptists who want to apply the next few verses to themselves will break their neck on these verses. And they have to add words, subtract words, or explain the verse away, or make it uh, spiritualize it to make it fit eternal security. And Hebrews 6, 5 says, And have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So what's it impossible to do? In verse 4 it said it was impossible. It's impossible if they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance. So it is impossible to renew them again unto repentance if they fall away. Is that not what the verse said? And now I don't know about you, but I don't take this verse for myself in a doctrinal sense. If I fall away, get off into sin, I'm still saved. I can't be unsaved. A person in the time of Jacob's trouble who is saved and has been made a partaker of the Holy Ghost can fall away. And Revelation 14, 9 through 10 shows that a person who takes the mark of the beast will go to hell, and this teaches us that by taking the mark of the beast, a believer in the time of Jacob's trouble can lose his salvation. If he has the Holy Spirit, it will be gone. He falls away by taking the mark, loses the Holy Spirit just like Samson and Saul did in the Old Testament. And if that is heresy, then I just taught heresy by reading the verse as it said it and rightly dividing it, applying it to who it is supposed to be applied to. And now a lot of the things I've taught in this study... People are going to say it's heresy, and most Baptists wouldn't like it, and they will say, your teaching works for salvation. They will then say, I'm teaching more than one gospel and adding works. They will then say, I'm unsaved, and then they'll put me in hell. And now, where did I say a Christian in the church age was saved by works? I told you we are saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, and we can't lose our salvation. They are the ones teaching works. They say I'm going to hell because I teach a doctrine they don't teach. So according to their standards, I have to believe the gospel and teach the same doctrine they teach to be saved. Now tell me again, who is adding works to the gospel? I believe the gospel is in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Paul says in verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And if you believe that gospel, putting all your trust in that to save you, then you're saved. There's no works involved. They're the ones that add works. They'll say, well, you can blaspheme the Holy Ghost. You can sin your way out of the day of grace. That's works. Uh, we're not kept from getting saved because of sins we've committed as a lost person. You're not um, 
kept saved by works. And then the same guys who will teach that I'm preaching more than one gospel here will say that they're going through the tribulation and if a person takes the mark in the tribulation, then that person's going to hell, which is true. But that's a work. If you believe that a person who takes the mark of the beast is going to hell, you're believing they're going to hell because they didn't abstain from doing something. Abstaining from doing something is a work. Adam and Eve, before the fall, what were they told not to do? They weren't supposed to eat off the tree. And if they did this, they would have eternal life. They would still be here. But what did they do? They ate off the tree. They lost eternal life. They died because of not abstaining from something. It's the same case with taking the mark. But this has been rightly dividing and the Holy Spirit.